Welcome back to Rasm Star TV. Today I'm having uh, Dr. Jim Emmons again, and he also, a colleague of him, came here to show us a small sword techniques because today we are going to talk about the history of small swords. What is small sword or what where small swords? And then uh, you're going, to, and they're going to show us some techniques. Welcome to Rasm Star TV, gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Korsani. Um, my name is Jim Emmons, as, as you said, and this is my colleague, Ken Jay, and we've been doing, um, you know, we studied a lot of different things, but we spent a lot of the last year, I'd say, looking at small sword and spending most of our time on that. Okay, uh, yeah. let us just start with small sword. When, I mean, uh, when did they introduce small sword in, Europe, in Europe? I mean, we have rapier and there's small sword. Can we say right. that? Yes, uh, and they're, they coexisted for some time too. Uh, but a lot of the earlier texts, they actually will call the same weapon a rapier. And they don't really appear, I think the earliest, as people define it, I think it's from 1635. But in the 1640s to 1660s, there are a number of paintings um, and also extant examples in museums of what they call scarf swords. And these were sort of, slightly smaller rapiers, lighter rapiers than some of the other ones. Um, and they're called scarf swords because many of the portraits, there's like a gentleman wearing a sash or a, you know, a scarf. Uh, and the sword is, is, is being held on that uh, rather than like a baldric or a, a belt. And um, so they were around 1640s, 16, you know, we start seeing stuff that looks like a proto small sword, um, but it, they didn't really take off until the 1660s. And then that's when they started going around it. The tricky thing is there's a lot of similarity between them. Um, you know, I think most authorities agreed that small sword is just a smaller rapier initially. Uh, and there are reasons for that. I mean, I I'm not sure we have any hard answers, but there, there are some interesting stories about why people might have started preferring a small rapier. Uh, Jim, the question which I always have, a rapier offers you more protection, correct? Imagine, let's say, you have a buckler here, which protects your hand, right? Right. So now, please, you said they coexisted. Now, yeah. give me one reason. Why should I choose something which protects my hand less? That's a great question. Uh, well, I think two things. One, um, small swords are, are generally pretty light. I mean, we're talking, I think, on average, 400 grams. And so they're very nimble. And if the forte or the strong part of the sword is strong enough and your technique is good, you can cover your lines pretty well, but you also have the advantage of speed. And so against a slightly heavier weapon, assuming good judgment, good measure, good timing, you could probably hold your own pretty well. I mean, one thing that we have found out is that on the, the shell of many of these small swords, we hit it with a thrust more often than we think. And that's despite the fact that part of our hand is exposed. Now we get hit in the hand sometimes too. Um, but I think the speed is one reason that you might choose it. Um, and then there's some practical considerations. So there's, I think it's in uh, Johnson's life of, uh, oh gosh, I'm gonna mess this up. I think it's Samuel Pepe's. Uh, there's a, an anecdote where he's talking about um, being in a crowd near a coffee shop somewhere in London. And there's this, large uh, officer, Captain Oakshot, whose sword is tripping everybody up and getting caught in their coats and, you know, sort of a, a, an aside. But, you know, when you're in a, a crowded urban area in particular, a big sword can get in your way. Um, and even today with like military that have a dress sword, you have to remember to enter from the left side of your chair. There are all kinds of these, you know, etiquette things that you have to remember. And the smaller that sword is, the easier that is to do. So I think there's that practical consideration, but I think the other thing that comes out of, uh, and the, the reason you might prefer a small sword is that the technique is very similar to rapier. I mean, it's, you can look at text side by side and there's so much overlap, but the difference is that because it's lighter and faster, you can make some of these actions more quickly and you can do some actions that are more complicated because it's light enough to do it. So there might be that consideration as well. Uh, complicated in which sense, Jim? Well, um, so for example, like uh, both rapier and small sword use a disengage where I'm on one side of the blade, let's say, you know, the blade's facing me here, I'm on the inside line, and I dip under or I cut over to the other side. 
you could do that with a rapier just fine. Yeah. But you have to calculate your measure and the weight of the weapon. And of course, you know, you've been training with it, so you know what these things are. Um, with a small sword, it is surprisingly quick to just go under and over that blade super fast. And so against a heavier weapon, um, you have that advantage on them. And so if I wanted to go around twice, make a Dublet, as they call it, right, and then trap the blade, I can make that faster than the person with the heavier sword. Uh, and it's a trade-off. Like, I lose some of that protection, and I gain that speed. Okay. And yeah. um, regarding small sword, can you cut with this? Oh, that's a fun debate. Um, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> so, uh, like, Ken and I were looking at some of the earlier systems and some of the earlier examples. And I think this is one of those places where we tend to get hung up on definitions. You know, there are people who say rapiers absolutely cannot cut. Small swords absolutely cannot cut. But then we find examples with blades that have a sharp edge and that could cut. Now, is it going to be a hewing sort of blow? Probably not, right? Um, but there are small swords with an edge. Um, and we also have anecdotal evidence from duels and other things where people have uh, cut their fingers trying to grasp the blade. Um, over time, they become almost purely a thrusting weapon. But I think in the early period in particular, we see those blades, especially since um, a lot of early small sword blades were cut down rapier blades. And so for rapier blades that could cut, if you're just cutting that down, um, it's also one gonna make it stiffer, but two, uh, it might still be able to cut. But Jim, we have, we have rapier cuts, right? Yes, yeah, okay. yeah, we do. And see, that's one of the things that, we, we tend to be very monolithic about this. You know, there are, I, it's probably a dead debate now, but for a while I remember there were people saying, you know, rapiers don't cut. And then people would show you an example of something that's clearly a rapier, right? It's a 39 inch blade with an edge. And it's like, well, that could cut, but it's a question of what kind of cut, right? So like a stromazione is gonna be a very harassing kind of cut. Like if I just throw that tip out there and it's speed and everything else, that, that's not gonna feel very good. Um, I'm not gonna hack somebody's arm off with it, but that's not the purpose of those cuts. No, I mean, uh, I, I need to mention something. Maybe, sure. maybe it's useful for you. I, yeah. um, I, as you know, I uh, analyze inventories of 22 museums in Iran and Europe. Sure. And uh, among them also, I handled many, many European ah. sorts, right? Oh, Starting yeah. from uh, even Viking er era up right. to, uh, I mean, 19th century. Uh, let me just be corrected. What I handled, I'm not talking about, I mean, it was also in Malta, it was here and there. Yeah. And I have not, or let's put it that way. Personally, me, I have not handled a single rapier without a sharp edge. A single. And yeah. we are talking about antiques, weapons with, in European museums with provenance, right? Right. I haven't seen, I'm not saying that they have, a, they have an edge like a shamshir, of course, but that's not the purpose, but right. they have an edge. Yeah. As far as small swords are concerned, I have to say I handled small swords, as you mentioned, which had an edge, and I have small swords, which were very stiff, but did not have edge. Yes. And, I, and this is only from my experience. And I think, I personally think, Specifically, handling antiques will shed lots of light, which uh, many, maybe manuals cannot necessarily completely give us information on that, right? So that's only my experience of 22 museums. I'm sure that you always say something about the weapon, then some example is found, which contradicts you, right? No, it's true, it's true. And yeah. I think, you know, I've held a handful of small swords. Um, and all the ones that I've held have been late. And so the blades have been largely triangular with no edge. Exactly. That's what... I've also, I've read, I've not seen or held, um, I think late century in Germany, there was um, another blade that came out that was more of like a V shape. And the edges were, were slightly sharp, but they were very brittle. And so I think a lot of examples, those edges probably suffered and were probably buffed out and it effectively becomes a, a less sharp weapon. Um, that profile is not great for cutting anyway, but it would certainly discourage somebody from grabbing it. Yeah, yeah. of course, yeah, of course. But I, I agree, I think, you know, from the mu museums I've visited, and I haven't had the, the luck that you've had to, to handle many of them, 
but you can see the edges on many of these rapiers. And I don't think all of them are cutting swords the way that like the Bolognese um, weapons are, that's different, you know, and you can just tell by the, 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 the weight of them, the heft of them sometimes, um, and profile, it looks more like a cutting blade. Okay. Do we have any small sword with complex hilt? Well, they have some fancy ones. Um, I think, you know, most are sort of um, a simplified rapier hilt, right? So if you think about like a cup hilt, you've got the, the keyons there, you have the knuckle bow, um, there's the pasdan you can put your fingers in, and then you've got swept hilts and things like that. And a small sword, as we think of it normally, is basically that, that bell shrinks. Um, I think, I forget exactly when it came into vogue, sometime in the late 17th century, but that bilobate, kind of shell um, that's in use for until into the 19th century. So it, it's, a, you know, a useful tool. Um, the big difference is they had a, a center punch in it and the blade was inserted into that. So the guard is sort of a separate entity from the blade mm -hmm. in a way that some rapiers can be more integral. Um, I'm not sure that definition really holds up, but uh, I'll show you an example. Um, <laughs> sorry for this. This is a, Castile small sword trainer. And um, if you look at it, it looks like a little tiny rapier, right? It's got yeah. pommel for counterweight. It has this sort of, uh, this sort of shell. Yeah. Hold it this way, so you can see the, the shape. Yeah. Um, and this is a very bare bones economy version, um, but it has the annulets here, sort of a, a vestigial keon and a knuckle bow. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's surprisingly effective despite its size. A lot comes down to positioning too. Yeah. Can, um, can you can you show yeah. our, our viewers how you hold the sword? Small sure. sword. How do you hold it? So, yeah. So this is actually one of the interesting things. Um, when you look at this grip, you see those annulets, and you think it's a lot like an Italian foil. So um, Italian foil. This is a good example. Has a very similar setup. Uh, and actually, many early small swords looked somewhat like this. They didn't have the knuckle bow. Um, scarf swords as well. And Italian grip, um, I don't, I sort of use the rings. I don't know if you can see this particularly well. Um, here, I'll go left handed. But my thumb and forefinger hold on to the ricasso. Yeah. Uh, ricasso, and then this finger kind of sits here. Ah, okay. And very often there's a, a Martindale here and it kind of keeps it very strapped to the wrist. Um, with small sword, it, it looks like you should be doing kind of the same thing and maybe putting a finger through that ring. But there are uh, a number of manuals. I think the one that sticks out to me is Le Perche, um, who says, don't put your fingers through those. You're really just going to hold it um, by that little false ricasso. And then your finger kind of rests against it the same way that it does on the Italian sword, Italian spoil. And why and so, not? Why not? I don't know. Um, I don't see a disadvantage to it. Um, can do you have any thoughts on my, that? My, my take on it is very practical. The analettes are much smaller that. than on, on you know, a, a rapier or even the Italian foil. And what I've discovered is that you can put your finger in there. The problem is it can be trapped in there if the blade is deflected hard or somebody grabs the blade. And now your finger is trapped in there. And okay, either my finger is going to be broken or they're able to control simply through com pain compliance with my finger. And if it's not in there, then I still have this range of motion, but I don't have the possibility of my finger all of a sudden. Yeah. Very good there. point. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's probably the chief reason. Um, and I, I think the other probably less important one is that when you shift your hand position for different guards, it's easier to do that if you're not locked in. Uh, and one of the other things in, in terms of, uh, we can demonstrate some of this later, that goes with the connection between small sword and rapier. Grappling doesn't disappear. Even some of the later manuals have weapon seizures uh, yeah. like that, which are much easier to do if you're not locked in. Uh, yeah. Of course, that's better for the person performing the seizure. Uh, but as Ken said, if the finger's in there and somebody tries it, they're likely going to break the hand. Yeah, absolutely, it will. Absolutely. Okay, before you, uh, gentlemen, you show the techniques, um, sure. 
You know that, you know, what I really love is when they use a rapier with uh, a dagger. So rapier and dagger. Did we have the same combination with small sword? Yes. Um, oh, oh, yes. No, okay, no, I was hoping to you that you say no. no. Okay, no, again. No, I know, right? Well, and this is a question. So, um, and Ken and I have actually been spending the last month on this in particular. Okay. So a, another sort of legacy, if you will, with rapier yeah. Um, a lot of texts have these fascinating sections on how to deal with different issues that, that come up. Uh, yeah. Those break down for me into like two major sections. One is for the small sword fencer who has the small sword by itself, how to deal with ethnic guards. So they'll have, you know, uh, sort of assuming you're reading a French text, here's what you should do faced with a German. And the German's going to hold their guard this way. Okay. Um, here's the Portuguese, here's the Spanish, here's, you know, and there, there'll be different images of these things. Uh, here's the Italian. Um, and so with these different things, they're fascinating. Um, for example, with the German guard in Domenico Angelo's uh, 1763 and reprinted in 1787 by his, uh, by his son. Um, he, you see a picture of a guy in a hussar's uniform with a saber in a hanging guard and the, the small sword fencer is going to you know, fence against him. Um, in the same manual, the Spaniard is in this much more sort of Rococo early dress with a destreza guard. They're standing straight up with a big cup hilt rapier. <laughs> and then there are several with the Italians, um, including uh, yeah. fighting somebody with, you know, sword and dagger, yeah. sword and, and sword and lantern. Okay. Um, which for a long time kind of confused me. I thought, why would you do this? But if you're traveling at night, you're going to have a lantern. Yeah. And so that's useful to block. It's also useful for shining into someone's eyes, although I don't really know how that works with oil or candle, but um, it's in these books. Uh, and then there are really strange things. Uh, Girard at 1740 in his work, um, the treatise on arms, covers fighting somebody with a grain flam. <laughs> And I, yeah, you have to wonder, it's like, did he, did he encounter this? <laughs> did this happen? Um, so there are these little oddities like that as well. Uh, and the advice is very, very good. Um, when I've looked at Gerard and Angelo when we were looking at Dagger, um, we actually ended up picking up some very basic parrying daggers. Oh, this okay. is a 12-inch flexi one. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think we pretty much concluded it completely changes the game. Uh, yeah. It is much, much harder to get to any target. Uh, exponentially harder. And there are easy traps to fall into. Uh, the advice that people give you um, for dealing with this is to not ever really attack to the inside line. Yeah. Uh, so if, I, if I'm on guard like this and you go to my chest, it's so much easier for me to stop you. Yeah. If you can find me on the outside here and go to my outside line, that's going to work but the thing is you know like when ken and i tried this um we both know we're trying to do this <laughs> and so it really complicates you know a lot and your timing and, and, and your choice of attacks really you're very limited yeah i i would not want to have to fight somebody with both you, you're you're fighting against a layered defense yeah. you have to you have to penetrate the outer defense of the sword and then you're still faced with the dagger that can come into play. It also, you know, it also works well to deflect. That's its primary mission is to deflect the blade. But that layer defense makes things much, much more, more difficult to attack the body. And you're 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 oftentimes saying, I'm attacking the arm, the hand, and the outside line exclusively. Absolutely. And also yeah. makes makes seizures and grabbing almost impossible. I mean, it, it does. Know. You can do it once. You can do it one time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, okay. absolutely. Yeah, it, it's, and I, you know, I think it's interesting that, um, and there's, there's probably a lot to be, you know, studies that can be conducted for the purpose for including these things. You know, is it uh, for completeness? Um, because I have to think that a lot of small sword fencers probably weren't ever going to face half these threats. But what about the person traveling to Southern Italy, where this was a common feature into the 20th century, at least in some training? Uh, the Neapolitan school kept the dagger 
and basically a rapier or a very light rapier into the modern period. And so that was a reality if you were down there and got into any kind of trouble. Okay, I mean, uh, let's, I mean, uh, let's just discuss a, a different, if we can, I know it's very hard, classify small swords. For example, if you go to rapiers, I mean, it's, even with rapiers, it's very difficult. You cannot even say cup is Spanish, then you find Italian right. cup right? Rapier, <laughs> exactly. right? And yeah. German cup rapier, right? You know, because mostly they say Germans, you know, preferred complex sealed open, but then there are cup Germans made in Zollingen, right? Yeah. And uh, so you can't say that. What about small swords? Can we classify them based on country or certain preferences? Well, you know, I think portraiture and the extant examples. So there are a lot of small swords. I mean, even now in the United States, they'll be on auction periodically. You can find them. There's always the issue of fakes. Um, but one thing that's very clear with museum pieces uh, and paintings is that there's a wide variety. Uh, because it's small size, um, an association with, uh, you know, some people call them town swords or court swords. So they were easy to wear at a crowded court or a, um, they become almost a type of male jewelry. And so a lot of the hilts that they have even in museums now look like they were originally gilded. Yeah. Um, very fancy ones. Now, whether somebody would want to fight with this is another matter, but they have perfectly good fighting blades with, you know, beautiful engraving and, and metalwork. Uh, some of the ones out of Germany in particular have these pierced gels that are gorgeous. The most beautiful small swords I saw were in Musée des Armées, Musée des Invalides in Paris. They are enameled hilts, they are gilded. Some of them are pure gold, pure gold. They have, you know, pure gold. Some of them are bejeweled with rubies, diamonds. Oh, yeah. And right? beautiful. I mean, what can, what yeah. else can you say, right? <laughs> I mean, it, exactly. So you, you've got these really, you know, can refer to it, you know, man bling of the 17th and 18th century, right? It's, um, and they have ivory from Asia and India. That yeah. People, very beautiful hills. Um, there are two basic styles, I guess you'd say. There are the um, small swords that sort of early, although this, it's hard to say, like, in a general way, you can say early small swords often didn't have enough of them. The problem with this is that some places stayed very fashion forward and other places decided that they just really liked the older style. So oh, okay. I think in some places in Scandinavia, if I remember right, they preferred it without the knuckle bone in this one area. So they were using that style long after it went out of use, say in Paris. Um, and a lot of personal preference seems to have gone into it as well. You know, I think on average, the blades are 76 to 81 centimeters. You're, you would probably know better than I am having been in museums, but they're, they're not super long. You know? No, no. But again, you know, somebody who's very tall might want one a bit longer. Yeah. You know? And they spread in all European countries, am I correct? I think so. Now, what's interesting is some places it was less popular. So for a while it was popular to say, well, the Spanish and Italians didn't use them. But that's not exactly true. We have small swords from Spain. We have manuals on small swords from Spain. Oh. Uh, Paranauts, for example, Juan Paranauts. Uh, and it's pretty classic small sword text. Um, for Italy, you know, I think especially now we have to remember Italy wasn't the Italy we think of in the same way that Germany was the Germanese, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. So, you know, in Southern Italy where there's a lot of Spanish influence, um, especially you see this in the Neapolitan school, they retain the rapier and dagger system much later than anyone else. Okay. Uh, in Spain, there was some small sword. And in Northern Italy, in those areas where there's more French influence, you see, soft, you see small swords. So, so can, have can I say that it was m more widespread in France? Can I make oh, such yeah. an assumption? Oh yes, you can. France, Germany, England, um, the Americas for that matter. Um, oh, yeah, I want to ask you. So it was yeah. also brought to uh, America. Okay, that's okay. interesting. Could you tell us? Could you tell us more about that? Because I'm very interested sure. in American history. 